Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. Today, I'm taking a look at some of the historical basis for the Trojan War, some early archaeology, and a look at Homer himself. In a previous video, I covered the mythic context of the Iliad, which I will have linked up above. Uh, and other than that, let's jump in. So the Trojan War. Most scholars agree that there was some conflict, possibly in Troy, that inspired the story or the beginnings of the story that became the Iliad, the Odyssey, and many of the other stories that it inspired sort of in the mythic cycle that we talked about last week. That's pretty vague. That's about as close as we can get though to any kind of certainty. As you may know, the Greeks at this time were not a unified nation, but rather an association of independent city-states, each with their own leader. That's why there are so many leaders together with sort of banded together with Agamemnon as the one leader of all of these kings. One thing you may notice as you read as well is that they didn't identify themselves as Greeks or Hellenes or some other word that we now translate as Greeks, but rather as Achaeans or sometimes Danans. So even this idea of Greekness uh, or an idea of being Hellenic was not yet formed for the Greeks of this story. The traditional date by the ancient Greeks of the Trojan War is 1184 BC. We don't know if this date or some other is accurate. Lattimore describes our sense of the historical Trojan War this way in his introduction. This war may not have been much like we, what we hear about. It may not have been a 10 years war. It may not have been Pan-Achaean in scale. It may not have been raged against Troy. And it may have been a defeat, not a victory. Personally, I think it was a Viking raid or several other such combined into one. But it was something, which justifiably or not, generated the story of Troy we know. So, like I said, we can't get super concrete with the historical basis of this. It was a long time ago. It's been muddled by hundreds of years of mythologizing and storytelling, so we really don't know. But one man who claims to know was Heinrich Schliemann. He basically pioneered the field of archaeology and he particularly loved classical history. He was an advocate of preserving antiquities for study, not just for personal collection. Uh, and so while he's criticized on other aspects, Obviously, this is our first attempt to be um, scientific and considered in the way that we perform an archaeological dig. He's got to be given a lot of props for really pushing this idea of archaeological study in this first place. He did excavate the site of Hisserlik, which is generally considered to be the site of Troy. But Schliemann was also a pretty good marketer, so to bring evidence to his findings, he connected them with famous concepts and figures with little to no evidence, most frequently to Homer's works. So one example of this is there's like a gold hammered mask that he famously called Agamemnon's mask, which was pretty much there to catch headlines. Um, so the site of Hisserlik is what's uh, basically a layered city where we can see that over millennia, the newer city was built on top of the older city, which makes it really nice for excavation. And archeologists today can sort of say like, oh, this is several layers too deep to be the right time for the Trojan War. This mask is quite a few hundred years older than when Agamemnon would have been there. So that's kind of fun. <laughs> As to Homer himself, Lattimore says in his introduction again, if it concerns Homer, it means controversy. So I have had to cut a rather sweeping path through a mass of difficult or insoluble problems, but we will try our best. The Greeks considered Homer their best poet. He's basically like Shakespeare is for us. He, held, he was held in the highest regard. He's quoted everywhere, referred back to in later works of um, literature. And he really represents the height of their poetry. The only author who would have come close to this level of regard is possibly Hesiod, but we see that Hesiod is not nearly as widely quoted as Homer, so Homer really has that top spot. For the Iliad and the Odyssey, we basically have complete versions written down by the 6th century BC, but still during this time when the story was being written down, it was also been performed by professional bards, or the actual term is called rhapsodies, so there's a new word for you. And they would have traveled and performed it, and they would have had, you know, the freedom to uh, do a bit of ex 
contemporaneous, spontaneous creativity on the fly. So it would have been, you know, varying versions as they worked within the framework of the story and made it uh, more fun and interactive with their audience. And in fact, the whole language of Homeric Greek at this time, Greek in general, is very sing-songy and um, lyrical. So I'm actually going to put a link down in the bottom. NPR many years ago did a recording of somebody performing it in the original Greek. It's many hours long, but just go listen to a couple minutes and you'll get a sense of how um, sing-songy it sounds. It's, it's really fun to listen to. So no one in antiquity and basically no one in modern times disputes that Homer, though there's very little to be known about the man whom we call Homer, composed both the Iliad and the Odyssey. And both groups are likewise in agreement that the Odyssey is the later composition of the two. Dating Homer is a bit difficult. He's kind of a bad boyfriend. But what we do know is that Homer, t that was, I really am sorry. What we do know is that Homer did not live close to the events that he talks about. So the Iliad, by his own admission, he talks about these events as being like very distant from himself. So for example, in book 12, Hector is doing this great feat of strength. But what he does say is that like Hector is much stronger and, and the Greek heroes of this time are much stronger than men are today. So there's sort of like this mythic distance and this historical distance between that time and then when Homer is composing his story. Greek legend also puts the Trojan War before what we call the Dorian invasion and the Ionian colonization. You can like Wikipedia that for more context on those two, whereas Homer lived after. So we know there are several hundred years between the Trojan War and Homer. And that's all I have for you today, short and sweet, and a lot of speculation. Next week we are talking about the form and structure of the work, so I get to be a lot more definitive and it's more in my wheelhouse, which history is not. If there are those of you who are watching who have more expertise in this area, I would love to hear your additional thoughts and commentary in the comments down below, or if you have other questions, I'd be happy to look them up for you and see if we can find an answer together. Until next time, I'm Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.